Hey everyone, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you happen to be. Welcome to another Ask an Expert session. We're very happy that you could join us here. Uh, my name is Ryan Strauss. I work for the IKEA Foundation, the communications team, and I'm very happy to welcome back our most experienced Ask an Expert presenter or moderator, Per Hegnes, CEO of the IKEA Foundation. Per, how are you today? I'm fantastic, thank you. I'm so looking forward to this um, Ask an Expert session. So hello everyone, welcome back to Ask an Expert. My guest today is a remarkable woman who has helped improve the lives of literally hundreds of millions of people living in poverty. Jacqueline Norgratz quit her Wall Street job to go to Rwanda to help set up a microfinancing business. That was 34 years ago. She has looked back since. She went on to fund Acumen in uh, 2001 with the idea of investing in philanthropic patient capital in entrepreneurs seeking to solve the toughest issues of poverty in the world. And since then, Acumen has invested over $130 million in 136 companies, impacting the lives of over 300 million low-income people worldwide. That's quite a number. That's quite an achievement. After supporting hundreds of entrepreneurs, Jacqueline and her team recognized that character was the crucial ingredient for success. So this year, they launched Acumen Academy to instruct others in global social change. Jacqueline, welcome to Ask an Expert. It's so great to be with you, Pear, and everyone here. Thank you. So Jacqueline, before we get any leadership insights you share in your recent book, I just wanted to touch upon the work that we have been doing together for the last five years. And more specifically, uh, on the exciting collaboration we have on providing clean and renewable energy to people living in poverty. You point out in your book that energy poverty is not just a market failure, it's a moral failure. Mm. So we both championed decentralized off-grid and mini-grid projects simply because we believe they are the most cost-effective and climate-friendly solutions. And access to energy is not only about improving life at home, it's often also an important gateway to livelihood development, as we know. So what has been your experience in championing leadership in the renewable energy sector? Thanks so much, Per. And, um, and this is actually a place of all of our work um, that has been deeply transformative in large part because of the partnership with IKEA Foundation. Um, from the very beginning, um, we created a real partnership, and I think that's part of uh, leadership for the 21st century as well, um, bringing different entities together to solve something bigger than ourselves. Uh, the conversations were honest. They were focused on the problems that we were solving, and then together, IKEA Foundation and Acumen really looked at the right kind of capital, and we can talk about patient capital, the character of the entrepreneurs in, in whom we were investing, but the pioneering energy facility went further than that, than that because we both understood that it was only by building an ecosystem um, and going to those frontier markets like Sierra Leone, like other parts of Africa where there was really no clean energy sector even to, to see that we could really make change. And so it was with that support that we started to invest in companies like Easy Solar in Sierra Leone at a time when that country had um, only 11% of the country electrified. This tiny company had 4,000 um, had 4, uh, customers and really because of the facility supported by IKEA Foundation, they've now reached 350,000. So I would say you build leadership in a sector by taking risks where nobody else will go, by um, finding the right partners, by convening an ecosystem, and by telling the stories, and um, and I and I, and I'm not just saying this, but I really take my hat off to IKEA Foundation for the kind of support that has been so truthful and so grounded in some of the difficult realities with which it with which we have to work, and yet bring the right tools to bear so that we can create real change. So energy makes such a huge difference for people living in poverty, especially in rural areas. Why do you think it's taken so long for uh, the philanthropic sector and the business sector to actually see this as an investment opportunity? Pear, this is why I call it a moral for failure and not just an economic failure. Um, up until 2007, uh, 1.5 billion people in the world had no access to electricity. Think about that. It's 130 years after Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. And I think the reasons 
um, that come through the entire acumen model become very clear. On the one hand, the, the traditional markets and certainly investors didn't see any viability for people for bringing electricity in rural areas where people made one, two, three dollars per day, where there's no infrastructure, there's high levels of corruption, there's no trust, there's a low skill level, makes sense for markets not to go there. On the other hand, well-intended charities would often think, well, we'll, we'll give people um, what they need. And yet, one, that's not scalable. And two, it comes from a place of one's own imagination not the moral imagination of really seeing low-income people as customers who want to make their own decisions. And so there's a mismatch, either both on the pure market side and on the pure charity side. The beauty of the work that we've done together with um, patient capital has allowed this off-grid energy sector now to reach, as you, as you said, you know, hundreds of million, uh, millions of people, just one of our companies d -Light, which we invested in in 2007, has now brought light and increasingly affordable electricity to 100 million low-income people who are making their own choices and are actually driving the future um, in ways that are truly inclusive and um, help avert long-term climate crisis. We'll talk about scale in a moment, but before we do that, um, maybe you want to share to the audience uh, how you define patient capital, because that's a word that you use a lot and it's very central to the success of what you're doing. Thanks, Pierre. And we learned what patient capital was along the way, I would say, um, even when we started um, seeing how impatient typical uh, investors were, we thought we would be patient by looking at, you know, seven, eight year terms. And it's turned out that if you really want to create a new sector for the poor, um, we're talking 10 to 15 year capital. We start by raising philanthropy, and this is how IKEA Foundation has supported us, so that we can take bets where markets and governments and aid have all failed to create real results for the poor. We um, find the right character um, and invest in it, as I said, for 10 to 15 years. Importantly, um, and this was also a learning pair, as you know, we had to bring the right kind of talent and accompaniment to those companies as well. We had to learn to measure what mattered from the perspective of the people that we were serving. And any money that came back to Acumen would be reinvested in an innovation for the poor. So the power of having that very flexible, early stage, long-term capital is that it ended up leveraging um, you know, five, six dollars to every dollar that we invested. So that while our philanthropic side has um, invested about 130 million, we've moved over another 800 million. So our companies have been able to raise uh, about a billion dollars um, since we've started. And I think that also shows both the market gap and that as we reimagine capitalism, we need to have the courage to go into that space that is between traditional markets and between traditional charity. That's fascinating. So the partnership between the two organizations, Acumen and IKEA Foundation, really enables people living in poverty to develop income and assets in a green and an inclusive way. So by putting them at the center of energy sectors approach to renewables. So, and we are both obviously committed to powering communities with renewable energy and in line with the global SDGs. So here's my question to you. What is your advice for the leadership in the energy sector to close the sustainable energy gap by 2030, ensuring universal access to affordable and reliable and modern energy services? Thank you for asking that question. And again, here, it's where I really do believe you all set a standard for the way a, a, a foundation, particularly mm -hmm. with connections and a background in how markets work and corporate supply chains can be so powerful. Um, that you allowed us not only to um, invest, but to convene and build out the ecosystem to the point where now Acumen is the largest off-grid investor um, in solar for the poor in the world. Um, and we're part of a larger community that has been built over the last 15 years that now represents about 350,000 jobs, 500 companies. And so we have a lot of in-depth data now on how possible it is that off-grid solar is cleaner, faster, more effective, and that low-income people actually can use markets 
to cover a lot of the of the work that needs to be done. On the other hand, there are fr frontier markets across Africa, like Sierra Leone, like Togo, um, like Burkina Faso, where we're still looking at very, very low electrification rates. And indeed, the large majority of the unelectrified exist within about 15 countries. Traditional markets will not serve those, nor will waiting for the grid to just be built and extended. Um, the saying will often go among the cynical that um, it takes the grid from nine years to never to reach a low income household. It costs about 1500 to $2,000 per household to connect to the grid. Um, whereas with a low cost solar, people can pay 40, 50 cents per day to cover a $150 system. Um, so what it takes is a lot more of this frontier capital um, where we are providing the right financial set incentives to bring companies into those markets that have to be built from the ground up, quite frankly. We have to do more work on the ecosystem and even then, um, from our assessment, probably 10% of people, if you're just looking at Africa, won't be able to afford even the basic level. And so there's a, a, ro a role here as well for governments to provide um, a level of subsidy to enable full inclusivity so that we can reach SDG 7. The thing that confounds me, Pear, is that this is so eminently achievable. Um, at such a fraction of the money that has been put aside to extend the grill grid, largely with fossil fuels, um, that, that the reason that we aren't moving there fast enough is a failure of the imagination, I would say the moral imagination, not because we lack the know-how, the tools, the skills, or quite frankly, the talent. So what we need is another hundred acumens who can uh, help scale this further, is it? Um, and, and if that's the case, how can we get more? Uh, what we need is another 100 IKEA foundations. And I'm and what, <laughs> honestly, what we need is to change it. And, and I say this a lot that we don't just need technical shifts anymore. We need a mind shift. We need more governments, foundations, um, uh, development, financial institutions to understand that there is a flexible kind of capital that we need to use so that we can build in the accountability of the markets and combine it with the humanitarian ethos that we're all in this together. Um, and if COVID has it taught us that, the imminent and much larger threat of climate change is right on our heads. And you see that more in um, these fragile markets where the poor reside than anywhere else on earth. And so, um, yes, we need more acumen, but we need the right kind of funding. And that is in short supply. Funds are there, not the right kind of capital. Well, clearly the poor are the ones suffering the most from uh, the increase in climate change. And we all know that. And, and there are ways that we can um, help to change that. Let's um, use that as a good segue to um, talk about the fascinating book that you just released uh, about leadership practices to build a better world. I, I feel it reads like a synthesis of all your learnings over the last 30 years about what kind of leadership traits are essential to building successful businesses in poverty-stricken communities. So why don't you share with us why, why, why did you decide to write this book and what kind of message do you want to send to the world? Um, well, thank you for that question. You know, I sat down after you know, thinking that soon we'll be at 20 years uh, with Acumen as you said, 35 years, which is hard to believe of doing this work. Um, and I thought I would actually write about impact investing and that this is what Acumen was known for bringing into the world. But when I stood back um, and really thought about what made the difference between those um, entities that are building companies and those entities that are actually changing systems, it came down to character. It came down to those teams and individuals that were willing to um, be very uncomfortable with uncertainty and, and, and go against the status quo, uh, sometimes for many, many years, um, that did not want to change definitionally. And that there were actually a certain set of principles and practices that were themes from the most successful change agents in the world. 
right now we're at a point in history where the current institutions that we have counted on have run their course. We all know that. But we've not yet reimagined with what to replace them. So we talk about stakeholder capitalism. We talk about um, building fully inclusive and sustainable societies. We need the models for that. And so having gone to business school, those models aren't coming out of, you know, just drive to the bottom line. Um, those models have to be invented. And, um, and I've been thinking about for this generation, our generation and the next, um, what then would be the practices of leadership to drive the change the world needs to see? Yeah, you, you, you refer to these leadership themes as practices. Um, who do you hope will practice them? <laughs> yeah. You know, I thought about principles, um, but principles are too easy. We all go, yes, 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 we agree. But even something like courage, I don't know people who are born courageous. Um, we gain courage by practicing courage. And right now we need more than just a fearlessness, a recklessness. We need moral courage to stand up for those who are different from ourselves. Um, that comes at a cost often, whether it's inside a company or whether it's within a community or sometimes just a family. And so um, the idea of the principle of moral courage is not only to understand that we need to speak and do on behalf of those who are unlike ourselves, the vulnerable, the earth, but also um, to practice so that when we were needed for the big change, um, we're ready for it. And so I was very deliberate in saying this is about practice because in a way, Pear, now comes the hard part for all of us. Um, we have, COVID has exposed all the wounds of our broken systems now and we're seeing protests that are so thrilling um greta uh in the streets now comes the work of actually building and um that's the hard part and it's the exciting part it is and you provide a very interesting analysis of a number of examples in your book where you show how this um, issue of character has has really help people overcome real barriers, real, real hindrance, and, and actually succeed and succeed at a large scale. Um, there's one um, leadership practice that you talk about, uh, which I find particularly interesting, and that's the one that says partnering with humility and audacity. You actually talk a lot about audacity in your book, and, uh, and you make the point that if we believe that uh, a moral revolution requires everyone, we must become skilled at building trusted partnership across sectors. So what does it mean to form effective partnerships? And can you share examples of maybe some that you think have been particularly successful? Thank you. Well, you know, I, I started, and that's why I was very careful not to say this is about flattery to IKEA Foundation and Acumen, but what has made it an effective partnership is the common goal, the North Star, really spending time at the beginning to understand that there were shared values being willing to disagree so that we could understand um, where we, what we each brought, where we disagreed, where we needed to come to agreement. And, um, and then we have stayed the course. It's, it's already been five years and we're looking forward to many more years. And so I think approaching partnership from a place of vulnerability and humility, but also audacity. Um, and it often starts by recognizing your own weaknesses, not just what makes you strong, um, what you're good at, why you're in the partnership. These conversations too often don't happen. One of the examples I use in the book is a company called um, Ethio Chicken, which started actually with two young guys who had never held a live chicken in their lives, but saw an enormous opportunity in Ethiopia because there were essentially um, very few chickens in the country, um, a huge malnutrition problem. And eggs, of course, are one of the cheapest source of very high quality protein. And so um, they got the, the contract essentially to take over um, a defunct government poultry farm and had the assumption when they first went in that yes, we'll work with government, but um, they thought they understood what the private sector was good at and that what government was good at and the government would have low trust um, 
when in fact in Ethiopia, it's the opposite. That when you're dealing with poor rural farmers, the government actually has deep trust. And so they had to have the humility to recognize um, what they could bring, not just capital, but entrepreneurial instinct. They paid attention to the farmers as partners too, in terms of seeing what the farmers could do and not idealizing nor victimizing those farmers, recognizing that it's really a lot of work to raise a tiny chick from one day old to 45 days when they're actually laying eggs. And most farmers don't have the time to be corralling and raising tiny chicks. But at 45 days, chickens can run free. And so they had to have the, the humility, I would say, to see both government in a different light, as well as the small farmers in a different light, and literally turn the business model upside down so that they could provide the farmers um, with chickens um, by working with a group of agents that would raise the baby chicks to a th uh, 45 days old. They'd buy them in batches of a thousand. They would sell to farmers in batches of two or three, which was all the farmers could afford. The government would help with vaccines and distribution. And um, today that company injects about $250 million of capital into the economy all but three team members of the over, you know, I think it's 1200 team members by now are Ethiopian, so huge jobs. They work with 5 million smallholder farmers and malnutrition in the, in the largest region where they operate has gone down by 11% because they partnered with government. Government also credits um, itself and the company um, for that, that really massive achievement. And that's what's possible, but it's, it's not possible if we come in with these assumptions, either ideological or um, just arrogant. Um, but we have to also see um, that we can go from zero to five million um, with the right kind of partnership, the right kind of capital, and certainly the right kind of character. Well, I think that's a really interesting point because um you can't really drive big scale change without working with the government and you have yeah. to rent on board. But uh, the way to do that is definitely to also demonstrate to the government that you're in it for the long term, not only with the capital, but also with your advice and your support and your scheduling and whatever it takes to, to, uh, for initiatives, to go to the next level and actually sh demonstrate uh, success and demonstrate change. And, you can't do that in two, three years. It often takes much more than two, three years. But when you do it and you demonstrate it really works, government is also very willing to think differently about how they take this to a different level of scale. And uh, I think our learning is also that this is not only about national government, this is about regional government. And in many countries, it's about local governments. And if you disregard building the relationship with local government governments, it's going to be very difficult to make things work. And that takes time. But that's probably one of the most important investments you make in order to drive um, sustainable change. That's right, Perrin. I would even go further that, that because what you're talking about is relationship. What we're both talking about is relationship and relationships don't happen overnight. And so we make mistakes when we, when we look at institutions um, as monoliths, whether corporations or governments or um, NGOs that, um, building the relationship and building it at multiple levels with key partners so that if one partner leaves, the, the relationship institutionally remains intact, um, I think is something that we've really learned along the way. Um, but finding the right people and some of the most morally courageous people I have met along the way are inside corporations and in governments. Um, and so we do a disservice by saying, well, government is corrupt. Uh, corporations are greedy. Nonprofits are fuzzy headed. Um, it's just not true. It's finding, recognizing the incentives that get in our way, but finding those individuals who um, are willing to work with systems and help change them. And, um, and I've gotten much more relationship driven in terms of the theory of how the world changes over the last 35 years. And that's a nice leading to um, another practice that you highlight, which is listening to voices unheard. Mm -hmm. 
And this is also central to the IKEA Foundation's approach to how we design programming and, and, and work with communities. Uh, it's not a top down, it's a bottom up in terms of creating solutions together. And you used the example of the fellow, your fellow Vimal and how his clinching to an outsider identity became a roadblock for development. What does it mean to, to listen to voices unheard and how can we come, become better listeners? Because that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, I, I always fancied myself a good listener um, and it talk about gaining a lot of humility by all the mistakes that I made. And in the book, I start. I talk about um, an extraordinary individual named Vimal, as as Pear said, Vimal Kumar, who um, comes from the scavenger caste. The scavenger caste is the lowest caste of the Dalits um, that formerly were called untouchables in India. Um, and he became an active fellow, and um, which is part of our big academy of fellows from around the world. And so I I wanted to to meet him before I. I saw him officially in the fellowship because I was so interested in how he had made his way um, to come into our, our fellowship. And I knew that he was working on a PhD. And so I invited him to meet me at a, a coffee shop in a busy part of, of Mumbai um, one Sunday afternoon. It was a really hot day. I was having other meetings in the morning. So I was in the shop when the hour when we were supposed to meet came and Vimal wasn't there. And I thought, what's going on? It doesn't make sense that he wouldn't come to meet the corporate CEO um, on time. Um, and then about 10 minutes in, I thought, maybe he's afraid to come in. Um, but he doesn't, for whatever reason, he doesn't feel comfortable walking in. And sure enough, when I went outside, he was standing there just sweating in the sweltering heat. And I, without thinking about it, I just hugged him and um, introduced myself and we went inside and I said, hey Vimal, let me get you a drink or something, you must be hungry, something to eat. And he said, no, 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 thank you. And he'd had some water and he sat down and we had this beautiful hour, hour and a half, two hour long conversation. And a few things um, I learned later, Pear, uh, like a year later from Vimal um, because we got very close over the year. Um, one was um, that while something triggered in my head to say there's something about him that doesn't feel entitled to come in, I was listening to his physical needs but not his emotional needs when I asked him um, about do you want water, do you want food? Um, and when he said no, I took it verbatim in part because I was busy, I knew we were running out of time and so um, he said to me later, you know, I was starving, but I didn't come into the restaurant because I had no money. And what if they asked me to buy something and I couldn't? Um, they might kick me out. And then when you asked, I thought you might ask me to split the bill. And I was so mortified that at my age, I had still missed that cue. Um, and so I apologized uh, profusely. It said I was gonna make it up to him. And he said, but what you also taught me in that um, time. He said, um, no one had ever asked me my story like you did. And no one had ever listened to me in the way that you listen. And he said, and I learned that listening is an act of hope, Jacqueline, because suddenly my story meant that I was fully important here in the world. And I said, well, maybe what listening really is then is an act of love. And, um, and he said, it is love. But for me, it was also strengthening. And I said, well, Vimal, is, is listening sometimes enough? And I think it's really relevant in this time of Black Lives Matter, in this time of our, our awakening to all of the racial injustice within our societies. And, um, and you know, I think sometimes it's, it's, it's not enough in that we have to move from what we learn. That is our responsibility once we see and once we understand that then we act. Um, and listening can be a deeply important gift um, if we do it from a place of inquiry where we are there um, and ready to change ourselves, not from a place of certainty and uh, a focus on trying to convince or convert another human being. And it's in that space of deep listening 
that of where we receive and we give and where transformation is possible. And so I think that um, here in this moment where our leaders seem to do, be doing everything but listening, um, we would be well served by, by, by leaders who started um, by listening and then by acting. Yeah, it's amazing how much you can learn by patient listening and uh, how exciting it could be and uh, how that sort of changes your perspective on so many things. Changes yeah. everything. As you have just explained. Uh, that, that brings me to a question about uh, moral leadership. And do you think there's a connection between moral leadership and diversity in the workplace, since you, you touched upon that subject? Absolutely. The importance of inclusion and representation and specifically in positions of leadership. Absolutely. And, and, I, and, and you know, what you see also, um, diversity, not for the sake of diversity, but diversity for the sake of being effective in an incredibly interdependent world, solving extremely complex problems. We cannot solve them through the lens only of our own imagination. And that's what we too often try to do. And then we wonder why things don't work. Um, moral imagination is deeper than that. Moral imagination demands seeing other human beings as fully equal to ourselves, neither above nor below. And I do think that too often we idealize or we victimize rather than recognize that we are part of each other. And so um, moral imagination also requires immersion, getting close to um, the people we want to serve. And that includes our teams, that includes our customers, all of our stakeholders. Um, and to do that, particularly recognizing that, that privilege and power are, are in every room, um, when the ones who are privileged, and certainly you and I as you know, the heads, sit and start from a place of, of true listening, then real opportunity for change starts. And, um, and it requires, and I think that's what this moment in history requires, um, us to hear things we don't um, necessarily want to hear. They're uncomfortable, but I'm coming to see discomfort as a proxy for progress. And so, um, an acumen once um, th with the advent of Black Lives Matter, we started to listen more closely to our own teams. And it was interesting that at the very same time, I was doing um, a series of conversations, first with our Bangladesh fellows, them with our India fellows. And these young people represent such an extraordinary diversity in their countries, um, from business leaders to uh, policemen to blind activists and, and, and leaders of farmers co-ops. Um, and as I listened to them talk about their hopes, their dreams, their disagreements, and there were many, um, particularly about their countries, but within a space where the whole idea was to listen to each other and learn about self, I realized that this is the power of diversity. Um, I realized again, this is the power of using our privilege to create platforms where voices unheard are, are raised to an equal level so that we can actually solve the real problems of our, our individual communities, our nations, and quite frankly, the world. Because when we're looking at climate, when we're looking at COVID, um, we need to come together globally, um, even though we need to execute locally. And, um, and that's another big challenge that we have at this moment. Thank you. So um, I'm going to try to take some questions from, from the audience. And, and I'll first refer to a comment from uh, Faye St. Rose on LinkedIn. She says, I hung on to Jacqueline's every word. What a storyteller and what a humbling story. So inspiring. Wow. Well, thank you, Faye. That that's deeply really meaningful. I have to uh, have a whole toolbox of, of humbling stories, unfortunately. <laughs> but I guess that's how you learn. Yeah, and a lot of them are in your book. Um, uh, we have a question from another LinkedIn viewer. He or she asks, how do we surmount this failure of moral imagination? Hmm. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for that question. You know, the first chapter of my book is called Just Start. And we surmount that failure of, of moral imagination by deciding 
that we don't wanna be blind and we certainly don't want generations in the future to look back and say how blind they were. We want them to say, look how hard they try. And so how the, the first is to um, look around us and find people who are different from ourselves and just ask questions. Be unafraid to, um, to listen, make ourselves more vulnerable. Um, I, I have found, in, in, and Per, you, you know this story, it's in the book, but I have found that um, all around us are extraordinary opportunities for our, uh, ourselves to be of use, to make change by um, simply seeing problems around us as opportunities. Sometimes they're problems we don't even notice until someone else points them out to us. And this is the moment of COVID and Black Lives Matter where we have a whole generation pointing everything out to us in really important ways. The story I just wanna share very quickly is um, one of a, a successful young engineer who had defined success based on getting a patent um, and, and then getting one at age 25 and thinking it doesn't feel very good. A few months later, he's sitting on the, the, the banks of the River Ganges, the large sacred river in India, when a, a friend, an outsider, points out this big mound of, of explosive yellow and pink flowers floating along where all of the people are, are getting blessings in the river. And, um, and he also noticed that the flowers are just oozing with insecticides and pesticides. And he's like, what's up with the flowers, man? And um, Ankit Agarwal, the protagonist of the story, um, was like, well, what do you mean? This is what people do. We, we, we give flowers to the temples. The priests put temp the flowers in the, the river. Um, and, uh, and he's like, yeah, but it looked like they're just poisoning the people in the river and the river itself. And so Anka got curious. That was the beginning of his moral imagination, not just shrugging and walking away, but following the thread of his curiosity. It's a long story, but he ends up um, finding out that every year Indians put 8 million metric tons of flowers into temples as blessings for the gods. Priests turn around and they dump the flowers in the rivers. Those flowers are covered with arsenic, cadmium, lead, and other toxins. Um, which do indeed poison people and the rivers. So Ankit devised a circular economy model where he would take the flowers from the temples, um, hire only women from Vimal's caste, the scavenger caste. So the, the most vulnerable people in society convert the, the waste, the flowers into incense sticks and vegan leather and sell them and sell them back to the temples and to, uh, uh, well, to individuals who would give them to the temples and to um, people within society. He now is a profitable, growing, beautiful company based on flower waste, providing high quality jobs uh, to people whose lives are completely transformed in ways that also clean up rivers. These are the kinds of companies we need to have the moral imagination to build. So what I believe we need is not only to just start but also we need to celebrate the role models and business models that are driven not just by profit, but put our shared humanity and the sustainability of the earth at the center of all they do. I particularly like that, uh, that story because it's this wonderful combination of taking waste and preventing waste and turning waste and upcycle waste into to new products. And by doing that, solving an environmental problem, but at the same time creating jobs really sustainable jobs at scale for young people who have otherwise never had a chance to, to exactly to get a job or get an opportunity to make a living and, and feed their families. So this is, this is such a great story because you see the combination of the different- Well, and it's the beginning, but if you stay with it, right? Like just with energy, when you were saying, once people have electricity, everything changes. Kids start studying, women's health gets better, um, then they want hair clippers, you know, electric clippers and refrigerators that they can sell drinks out of. Suddenly economies start building. With, with flowers, you can start to see other products, vegan leather. I can't wait to wear my first vegan flower, vegan leather jacket. Um, you know, there's other mini industries build on top of it, but in ways that are part of a reimagining of how we function more lightly 
and more beautifully um, in ways that um, include all of us. And I think that's the opportunity we have right now. So my friend uh, Bill Drayton, who founded Ashoka, keeps reminding me that uh, in a fast changing world, everyone needs to be a change maker, right? And um, so as a final question to you, how, how might everyone who have joined us for this conversation today take your practices into their lives? How do you think, how can they be leaders in shaping our future? What could you challenge them to do? Well, I, I would, you know, this is a moment for me that has me very reflective. I've just written a book that was all um, based on 35 years of what I've learned from mentors from previous generations as well as from the next generation um, with this idea that I want to pass it forward. And that sometimes when I look at Greta Thunberg and Malala and the young people in the streets all over the world now, not just my own home city, and I think, um, look at the just the ferocity and the clarity of this next generation and then I feel really disappointed when I hear people in my own generation say, what gives me hope is them, and this is for them to solve. Because this is for all of us to solve. That I actually think this is a moment for, yes, the fierce determination of a new generation combined with the wisdom, um, ancient wisdom from the past, and the wisdom for those of us who have tried, even um, those of us who have uh, messed up in terms of the systems that we have built um, to, to create that new world. And it does start with each of us. It starts with in our families and in our homes, in the decisions that we make in terms of what we buy. Uh, we work with sustainable coffee and chocolate. It, it, it doesn't, it, I, I, I don't miss the idea that this is a privileged thing that you can pay for you know, better coffee and better chocolate. And so if you can't afford, if you can afford sustainable coffee and chocolate, buy it. Think about from where our products are and how they're made. And I see the next generation doing this all the time because I think we underestimate our power as consumers um, in terms of driving decisions that um, our companies are making. If you can't afford it, um, you can talk about it. You can um we can do smaller things right now with covid certainly in in the states where we still are on on on, on semi lockdown just calling people who are in isolation um inside companies you know i talk to a lot of ceos who tell me how much they love the next generation pair and sometimes hear that the their, their younger associates will tell them what's wrong in the company but aren't coming toward to them with ideas for how to improve. What are the small and big things? Um, when my team said it was time for us to start composting in New York City, um, uh, they could see my eyes going, great. And thinking, how are we doing that? And they're like, don't worry, Jack, and we got it. To me, that's leadership. And, um, and so I say, um, think about what you can do today, um, this week, in the rest of your life, to give back more to the world than we take from it. Because if every one of us as individuals had only that maximum, give more to the world than we take. And then if you extend that to every organization, community, nation, um, corporation, certainly even investor, when you think about investing, not what can you extract, but what can you give, we would move from being consumers to citizens again. We would live more lightly. Um, and I would dare say that we would find a greater sense of meaning and purpose, which is at the end of the day, what we are all yearning for. Um, and with this moment, which is such a difficult moment in our history, can unleash in terms of an awakening and a, and a better tomorrow. Thank you, that's really great advice. Um, I'm gonna try to squeeze in one last question from the audience before okay. we run out of time here. It's a question of Jeannie Sabagunzi. Um, and the question is, in your experience, have you ever witnessed a leader who transformed herself or himself as a moral leader? Jeannie, thank you for that question. It makes me cry, actually. You know, one of the things I worry about with, with social media um, is we 
too often seem to be a turning into a shame and blame society. And, um, and so we don't give people the chance to make mistakes. And one of the things I've been very proud of with the Acumen Fellowship, so these are um, very, very diverse fellows across race, class, ethnicity, religion that Acumen um, identifies and accompanies as cohorts and the fellows accompany each other uh, for their whole lives. It's a one year program, but we never let go of each other within the community. Um, and, um, and some of our young, younger fellows um, grew up in families where business as usual included corruption and um, doing good things only after they did good business as usual and then amassed wealth. And, um, and so I, they've taught me that sometimes the biggest and hardest status quo are our own families that have expectations of us. We don't want to let those families down. And so in conversations and, and sometimes with mistakes, but with trust, which I believe is the rarest currency that we have, we've been able to mentor and see young people who aren't even sure they believe that you can really build this kind of character and operate in a different way. And, um, and I'll say, well, you know, if you really want Acumen to ever invest, this is the deal. And I've watched them um, change. I've watched them pay the price of making decisions where their friends are getting put on stages for doing things the easy way. And they're not because they're doing it the right way. And it's why we have to surround ourselves with cohorts of people who are looking to be part of that change, but are not seeing this as a righteousness and a path of purity, or recognizing that every human being is flawed and that we're all on a path. It's why that when we started Acumen Fellows, we used to call it the Acumen Leadership Program. Now we call it the Acumen Fellowship Program for people who are on the path to moral leadership. I actually believe that there are very few of us that can be ordained moral leaders. Um, and I don't think we need another hero in our world. We need all of us to do heroic acts. We need all of us to be on that path. Jack, and you have really demonstrated to the world that uh, supporting entrepreneurs and small business does not need to stay small. Um, philanthropy is often criticized for supporting models that never manage to scale, right? Your model that combines philanthropic grants and patient capital investment has demonstrated that you can help lift millions of people out of poverty. And you have demonstrated time and again that scalability is possible, but you also demonstrated that success also requires moral imagination and leadership. Thank you so much for being on Ask an Expert with us today. Thank you, and as I said, um, this work that we have done, um, we have done together. And that's been a big lesson of leadership is that um, we don't do it by ourselves. That real change, scalable change, sustainable change only happens in this kind of partnership that Acumen and IKEA Foundation have forged through that combination pair of humility, audacity, and character. And I see that in you, I see that in your team, and I see that in the longevity of people who are so committed um, uh, in both organizations to know each other and to define ourselves, not by any accolades, but by the work that we do together. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's been a true, true um, place of, of pride and, and just the beginning. So I just, I know I speak on behalf, not just of Acumen, but of all of the entrepreneurs. And as you said, now 300 million people around the world who have goods and services because of these kinds of partnerships. Fantastic. And, you know, we could provide the funds, but we couldn't do it without people like you. And we provide a lot more than that. And that is part of the partnership. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on, uh, on, on uh, Ask an Expert today. It's been a great conversation. I really appreciate your time, Jeff. Thank Thanks, you. Claire. Thank you. And, and to everyone out there, the, the manifesto for a moral revolution is currently available for purchase wherever 
books are sold, I think. Um, and please just check your booksellers and you can get it online, of course, as well. And if you want to learn more about the book, about Acumen or Acumen's online course uh, on moral leadership, you can, you can visit the website acumen.org slash moral revolution. Thank you very much for listening in today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I was muted. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining our Ask an Expert session. Our next one is going to be on 3 September. We're going to take a little break for August. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. Thanks so much, Pear. It was an absolutely wonderful session. And to everyone who commented, we can see just how uh, impactful your storytelling was. So thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you at the next Ask an Expert session. Bye, everyone. <laughs>